I hope this is this study is 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 being characterized. I hope it's, I hope this is coming across right in this study. My my goal in this study is is really to to focus on letting the t- the text speak for itself. One of the things that that we're really trying to do in this uh, in, that I'm trying to do in this study is is really to let the text speak for itself. I think oftentimes we, uh, when we read, we, we try to make the text say something that the text does not say. And, uh, you know, that doesn't mean that everything that, that I try to bring out in this series is, is I'm, I'm not trying to say that I know everything and, and, you know, and the things that I've taught in the past are not necessarily, you know, the, the, you know, the uh, right or wrong or anything else. But we're trying to, try to really just let the text speak for itself. And that's something that we don't always do when we study Scripture. Sometimes we try to make the text say something that it doesn't say. Or, or uh, you know, we try to, try to bring our, our preconceived ideas into something. And so, so tonight we come to a pivotal place in our study. We are 1,500 years into, into the Bible, from the time that God began to recreate the earth for His second family. I, I use the term recreate because that is what I believe the text speaks to. And um, God took Adam and Eve at the beginning of the Scripture, and, and, uh, you know, and, and He created them in His image to be re- His representatives on the earth. We call that uh, you know, His image bearers. And He had this uh, Edenic ideal, this, this concept that He wanted Adam and Eve to be His image bearers. And we know that got, uh, that got sabotaged. We, we understand that. And, and, uh, you know, and it got ruined, and they had to be expelled from the garden. And so now what we've been talking about up to this point is we're 1,500 years later. And I, I don't think I can overstate that. You know, I don't think I can overstate that as we look at Scripture, you know, and I, and I, and I talked about this last time, this is, 15, this is one half of the Old Testament. Yeah, that's a long period of time. I, we, we, uh, I, I think that's striking to us because we, we don't think about that. There's so much. There's so much that we know about this portion of Scripture you know, we read so much and we think, well, you know, this is all of it, but you know, you know, this is so much of it. And this is the detail part that we get, but there's so much that happens that we're not given details about. But what we do get is we get the aftermath. You know, there's so many details we're not told. There's so much that happened in 15 years of time, but we see the aftermath. We see what happened. We see what uh, the aftermath of whatever happened in these this period of time that we're not given details about, but we do see the effect of 1,500 years of what we call free will, what we call decision-making, where God gave His creation, God gave His the sons of God, and God gave mankind the ability to make choices. And if it doesn't do anything else, it ought to be a sobering reminder to us that our decisions matter. What we choose to do on a daily basis matters. I'm talking about every single day. How we choose to make decisions matters. Because, again, this is, this is 1,500, this is one half, you know, for all, for all intents and purposes, this little bit of, this, these, this little scant bit of our Bibles that we don't have any details about, whatever decisions, whatever decisions were made in this little bit of Scripture had a huge impact on the world. So much so that God felt like He had to flood the entire earth. <laughs> He had to flood the entire earth because of whatever happened in that little bit of space right there. One half, one half of the Bible is right there, or the uh, time-wise. So, so it ought to it ought to be a sobering reminder of whatever happened. So now we're 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 into this second half, really, then of the Bible. So here's the second half of the Bible right here. This is this whole all of this is the second half, time-wise. And now we're gonna. We wade into this sixth chapter of the book of Genesis, and we find there's two stories occurring simultaneously. They intertwine, but they're two really they're really two different stories. And we begin then in Genesis chapter six and verse number one. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. Now this is the first story. We're going we're gonna to talk about this being the first story here. Now let me just talk first about these sons of God. And, and there, are, there, are, there have always been kind of two, well there have been two schools of thought on who these sons of God are. I've made very clear what, what uh, you know about who these sons of God are. But let me just say, uh, just, just to kind of put the issue out here and, and for the sake of argument, 
throughout the history of Scripture, when I say throughout the history of Scripture, there really are kind of two groups that we're going to concern ourselves with when I talk about the history of Scripture. In other words, who's been reading the Bible? For our purposes, we could talk about the, there's a Jewish side and there's a Christian side. There's Judaism and then there's Christianity. There, on the Jewish side of Scripture, there has never really been any debate about who these sons of God are. On the Jewish side of Scripture, the sons of God, it, it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the term Elohim. There's never really been any debate. These sons of God, the term Elohim, has, it only means one thing. These are divine beings. These are, these are exactly what the Bible says they are, exactly what it means. Sons of God. These are divine beings. The term Elohim, as I've taught you already, as I've shared with you, from the Jewish perspective, the term Elohim simply means celestial being. It means, it means divine beings. It's, it's not, it, it's only the, it's only on the Christian side. It's only on the, uh, it's only on the Christian side that theologians, Christ, Christian theologians were the, were the only ones who really kind of became uncomfortable with something that had a supernatural kind of a feel that felt like they had to run to something like, you know, descendants of Seth. I don't know if any of you ever heard that. There are some on the Christian side that have run to, for the sake of comfortability, they started, to, they started kind of running to something like, well, sons of God were descendants of Seth as opposed to descendants of Cain. There's absolutely no scripture to go along with that. There's, no, there's nothing to, there's, it's, a, it's kind of a safe thing. They, they, it was kind of a made up story, kind of like the same thing as kind of making up a story about Cain marrying his baby sister who was not even born yet, rather than simply just accepting what the Bible says that he married a woman from the land of Nod, which is exactly what the scripture says, you know, and so, so it was kind of a, that was kind of a Christianized thing. And so, so, uh, you know, the, so there really was never any question about that. And again, and what we're doing in this study, right or wrong, like it or don't like it, we're, we're looking at the original text. We're looking at what the original, the, the people who this text was originally given to, which was ancient Israelites. And so sons of God, clearly, according to the people to whom God gave this. And let's, again, can we all remember, to whom did God give this passage? To Israelites. To Israelites. And again, let's not be so arrogant as to think that God gave it to them to hold for us. <laughs> right? God didn't give this to Moses for Moses to keep for us. All right, he gave it to Moses for the people of God, the Israelites. So they believed that the sons of God were exactly what the text says they were, sons of God. These were divine beings, Elohim. So, so we know what's happening here. So what is happening here? What's happening here is these Elohim were God's, these were God's original family and they were, they were put on a, God sent them to oversee or to watch, to protect God's second family, humanity. And they were to be, they were to be protectors or, the, or, or watchers or, or helpers, but instead they were tempted by the beauty of women. And so they took them wives. Now let me just take a, take a quick time out here. Let me, let me take a little time out and give you a little parenthetical uh, statement here. I use the term watchers. The term watchers. I want to I take a time out here. And if you can just kind of give me your attention for just a second. Does anybody know where the term watchers appears? HBO. <laughs> it's, it's thrown around a lot. Yeah. It was, does anybody know where the term HBO appears? Yeah, it's in the book of Daniel. No, it's not in the book of Daniel. <laughs> It actually appears, it appears actually in the book, it does appear in the book of Daniel, but, but it actually appears in the book of Enoch. Let me just give you a quick, a quick statement about the book of Enoch. And again, this is not in your study guide, this is just, this is me. I, I, want, I want to say something to you about the book of Enoch. A couple of statements, so please don't, 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 uh, make, please make sure you get this correctly from me because I don't want to be misunderstood about this. I have not, I do not personally use the book of Enoch. Just because something does not appear in Scripture does not necessarily mean that it's not true. However, I want to caution you, I want to caution all of us about using books that did not find their way into the canon of Scripture. I'm not saying that the book of Enoch is not does not necessarily contain some accurate information, but I want to remind you 
the, the people that put the canon of Scripture together did not include it in the canon of Scripture for a reason. I believe the Holy Spirit did, did not lead them to put it in the canon of Scripture for a reason. I don't know what that reason is, but I trust the Holy Spirit to have completed the canon of Scripture as He chose. So it does not mean that there's not parts of the canon of, of, of Enoch that could be helpful in study, but I would use the book of Enoch as a reference possibly to, to maybe help or to verify some, so, or to help maybe flesh out some parts of Scripture, but I would not accept it as a verified uh, truth base. Does that make sense? So in other words, it doesn't necessarily hurt to know portions of it, but I have chosen not to read it, not to study it, because I don't want my mind clouded by something that may or may not be true. Does that make sense? So I have chosen to limit what I use for my study to part to only to Scripture. Because I don't want, I don't want to, I just don't want to take the chance on something that is not necessarily Scripture true to invade my, my study because I could inadvertently share something with you that is not necessarily true. Does that make sense? But I'm not telling you not to study it. I'm not telling you not to read it. I'm not telling you that it's, that it's, that it's not necessarily, doesn't necessarily contain truth because there are actually portions of scripture where writers of scripture actually quote things, other writers all the time that aren't necessarily in scripture. So there are other sources of things that are true, but I just don't know what they are. I hope, I hope that makes sense. Okay, so the term watchers actually comes out of the book of Enoch primarily. So that term, is, it may be okay, but here's the point. Back to our study now. All right, so time back in. All right, you ready? So, so the sons of God, God... God, I believe God instructed them to be helpers, to, 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 be, to be an aid to humanity. But instead, they were tempted by the beauty of these women and they took them wives, stepping outside of the bounds that God had given them. They were not supposed to. This was not what God wanted. And so this is perhaps referred to, this may be, in fact, I've taught this in the past. I'm not entirely convinced now that what I've taught in the past about this passage is, is necessarily referred to in the book of Jude. The book of Jude actually refers to, to uh, angels who left their, their habitation, left their first estate. And that may or may not be my issue with that passage in the book of Jude is the fact that it's referred to as angels who left their first estate, left their habitation. And these are not angels. I think there's a distinction. The term angels is agelos in the, in the New Testament. And so I'm not sure that's the same thing, but it may be. But the point remains that the sons of God were not supposed to take these women so we have these sons of God. Now, this was certainly, though, a sin of very high degree, and it absolutely carried some extremely high consequences. When they stepped outside of what God asked, wanted them to do, it came some, there were some very, very high consequences. So note, please, as in some ramifications, note in, in verse number 3 as we continue to read. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. Now, this verse is going to teach us some really, really important things here. And, and this is, we've, we've got to, we've, we really need to, to, to focus on this for, for just a couple of minutes. I want you to, to note, God is lamenting here about the relationship that he has with his, the sons of God, and with man. He's going to give us some insight in here, and, and we've got to pay very close attention to how God words this. So note, when God is, is looking at the ramifications of these sons of God marrying these women and producing offspring with them, note God, here God is talking about his, his struggle with his sons of God. Watch, let me explain this, and then we'll put all this together. God has this family, this first family, these sons of God. His, his struggle with them has a certain character. They have a certain, they ha God had a certain relationship with them. He made them in a certain way. They are, they are his, his, he made them with a certain, uh, a certain 
I want to, I, it's hard to describe. I want to use, I want to use the word phys, a, a certain physical nature, but they were not really a physical being. They're a celestial being. God has a certain struggle with mankind. He made mankind in a certain way. They're a physical being. So God has a certain struggle with his son, the sons of God. He has a certain character. He has a certain character with his, with the, with mankind who is a physical being, but it's very different. God is, is a very, but these offspring are different. Notice he said, my spirit shall not always strive with man because he is also flesh. Do you follow me? Mm-hmm. He said, my struggle with mankind is different than my struggle with the sons of God Because mankind is flesh. Do you see the difference there? That's going to get really important here in just a couple of minutes. Notice verse number four. There were giants in the earth in those days. We're going to skip over that for just a minute. Because watch. And also that when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. So watch. He had a certain struggle with the sons of God who were celestial beings. He had a different struggle with mankind who were physical beings. These offspring were something different. Do you follow me? See, these offspring are something different. These offspring are not exactly like the sons of God, and they're not exactly like mankind. They're something different. And that's going to create a problem. That creates a real problem, and that's where God, now God has to deal with this. So let me explain how these sons of God, how these offspring are, are different. Notice these phrases. We're going to stay on these phrases for a couple of minutes. Again, remember, we read this in English, but we're going to go back and we're going to study exactly what is being said here in the original language. So note, what are these offspring really like? They bear children to them. The same became, watch, mighty men which were of old. Now, what does that sound like to us? When we read this, Mighty men which were of old. Well, for us, that sounds like, meh, what's that? Well, we're going we're gonna to skip over the giants for now. That's the second issue. See, there's two, two stories here. Remember, there's two stories. We're not going to talk about the giants yet. It sounds like, well, it sounds like <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> Mighty men which were of old. Yeah, so let me, let me give you exactly what that sounds, what, the, what those words mean which were of old. Those words, the, the Aramaic words actually mean everlasting, perpetual. Everlasting, perpetual. It's the idea, I think I put ideal, it should have been idea. Your study guide, I have a typo there. It, think it, it's, it's the idea of immortal. Immortality. This is, how the, this is how the ancient Israelite would have read this. It's the concept of immortality. This is what they got from the sons of God. Remember, the sons of God were not made like mankind. Do you remember? Go, can we go back to the Garden of Eden for a minute? When Adam and Eve got expelled from the garden, what did God do? Talk to me. Flaming sword. Why did God put a flaming sword in the Garden of Eden? So they could not go back. So they could not go back to the tree of. So that they could not live for. Why? Because human beings are not supposed to live for ever. However, the sons of God were free to go back and forth in and out of the Garden of Eden. Because that's part of that. That's part of their nature. See, God's struggle with the sons of God was different than God's struggle with humanity. 
Human beings were not supposed to live forever. These are something different. This is why God said in the previous verse, My spirit shall not always strive with man because he is also flesh. Flesh does not live forever. But there's something, these are different. These offspring are something different. So, so these, these offspring became mighty men which were of old. This concept of immortality. And yet, they were also somehow flesh. They were also somehow, they were some kind of a, they were some kind of a hybrid race of being. Part of their uniqueness, part of their unusualness within this civilization that was now on the earth is that they were somehow immortal. Now, we move on. What's the second characteristic that God is so concerned about here? The second characteristic that marked them as being different from the rest of, the, the rest of, uh, of humanity, as it were, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. What does that mean? Well, that meant uh, rising in honor, authority. It's the idea of seeking worship. These offspring were seeking the worship of the rest of humanity. They were seeking worship of people. Okay, and If you are immortal and you possess extraordinary abilities... You possess extraordinary, you, know, you live longer than everybody else. You have these extraordinary abilities. They were seeking worship. So, so, and by the way, they were getting it. So what do we have here? Let me just take, take a time out here. Just take a time out. Did you ever wonder, did you ever wonder why every civilization on the earth has similar stories that are steeped in mythology? Look, let's just, let's just take a time out for a minute. Do you know that every civilization that has written records has very similar stories of mythology? Every one of them. Every one of them. It doesn't matter where they, it doesn't matter where they are on earth. Now, I'm not just talking about this area. I'm not just talking about Mesopotamia. I'm not just talking about Middle East. I'm talking about anywhere on earth. Any continent, they all have very similar stories of mythology. What, are those, what are those stories have in common? Well, they have in common things like gods who live on mountains and in gardens. They have demigods. What's a demigod? Half god, half human. They all have the same stories. They all, they all have super strength. They all have immortality, you know, in, interwoven in them. They all have they all they all have giants. They all have super strength. They all have these things. Now, now, what is what does that tell you? You know, you know. Have you ever heard somebody say? Uh, and by the way, they all have a universal flood. They all have these universe. They all have these similar stories. Have you ever heard somebody say? You see, the Bible gets all of its stories from myths, from mythology. No, mythology gets all of its stories. From the Bible. This is where all those mythology stories come from. Is it possible that all these civilizations get their mythology stories from real events that the Bible actually has already recorded? Hmm. Do you want to say something? Oh, okay. Now listen. Now. What we actually have here, what we actually have here, is we have a one true God who's watching his, his creation spiral into chaos through disobedience. Now, we read it, and here's the point of all this. Now, don't get lost in all that. Don't get lost in all that. What we have is we have the one true God who is watching his creation spiral into chaos through disobedience. I mean, disobedience in, in wholesale, right? Nobody's following God's rules. It is a mess. That's called chaos. Now, what does God do? Now, by the way, we read in English. See, this is, we're reading this in English, but there's a whole lot more going on than what we read, yes? 
God doesn't necessarily need to tell us all the details. But what we're reading in English, there's a whole lot more going on. What we have is we have these Elohim who have had offspring. Watch, this is the important part. Who are seeking and getting the worship of humanity. This is the part we don't want to miss. We have these Elohim, these offspring of these Elohim who are seeking and getting the worship of these of humanity. Now, this is something God has given free will to all of his creation, but worship is not something God will tolerate for very long. So he has pronounced a time limit of 120 years from the birth of Noah. And by the way, would you like to know what Noah's name means? I talked about names on Sunday. Yeah. Noah's name means rest. rest. It means rest. Now, just like when God re started recreating the earth, and in seven, day seven days later, he made the Sabbath, which means rest. Out of chaos, God always creates a rest. Out of this chaos, God's name... Noah means rest. God is going to God is going to create rest for the earth through Noah. 120 years from then. So what we have, God has put a time limit on it. Now, that's the first story. That's the first story. The second story that is playing out, we go back to Genesis 6, 6 verse 4, it's the first line but it's a separate, separate story. There were giants in the earth in those days. Now, that's a separate story. There were giants in the earth in those days. Now, the, not counting the multitude of hoaxes. Now, let, let me just, let me just let, let's just take a time out. Have you ever seen, there, there are tons of hoaxes out there. If you ever get online and you Google giants in the earth, and if you ever see somebody standing next to a skull that's as tall as they are, that's a hoax. Okay, that's a hoax. That's not real. We're not talking jolly green giant. That's a hoax. But an eight foot tall human being is a giant. On all over the world, all over, on at least four out of seven continents, there have been legitimate archaeological findings of giants. Not just an individual, but, but like whole villages or civilizations. Like whole families and, and villages. I mean, there have been civilizations of giants. In other words, there, it's not an anomaly. It's, it's a legitimate, like th these groups of people that are giants all over the world. And many of them date, and they date all, you know, they, many of them date back to the time of what we're talking about here. You know, and, and so, so, so what does that mean? Well, that means when the Bible says there were giants in the earth in those days, that means it's true. <laughs> can, I just, can I just lay something on you here? The Bible is true. Amen. Okay? The Bible is always true. Always. If the Bible says there were giants in the earth in those days then there were, by, there were giants in the earth in those days. And even if there were no archaeological digs to prove it, then it was still true. But it's kind of nice that there, were, that there are all over the world. See, I think sometimes we think, we, I think, sometimes we think that, that things only happened in Mesopotamia <laughs> back in these days. No, there were people all over the earth back in those days. There were giants in the earth in those days. Bill, do you want to say something? Yeah, Neanderthal man and Chromat. Yeah, we we that's a that's a. I'm just not sure everybody else is ready to have that conversation right now. But yeah, that's a that's a conversation I can have, and I'm just not sure. I'm just not sure everybody's ready for it. But but yeah, go ahead. I do have a question. Go ahead. God says, "My spirit won't, won't strive with men." Yes. What's his spirit? If it's not the Holy Spirit, is it the Holy Spirit? Yes, it is. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah, it, it, yeah, I do. It is the Holy Spirit. And he said, he, he said, my spirit shall not always strive with man, 
for that he is also is flesh. And that's where he was drawing a comparison between the sons of God and man. And he was saying, man, has, man is flesh. Sons of God are not flesh. And he was drawing a comparison between the two. He said, I've got to deal with them differently than I deal with them. And we're about to see how differently. So hang on, if you, if you could. Because it's, it's, it's about to get really real here. And it's about to be a little shocking. So here we go. So, so here's this second story. All right, so, we have these, so, we have these, uh, so we have these giants. Now, again, I think we have this tendency to believe that this is only happening. Now, that's all we're really going to deal with the, with the giants. But here's where it really gets interesting. So, so what time is? Okay, we're good. We're good. So here's where it really gets interesting. Now, just stay with me. And, and again... Please remember, these are theories. These are theories. But I'm backing all this up with Scripture, but, but, but watch what's about to happen here. Here's where this gets interesting. Both of these stories, I think for most of us, for most of us, we've got these giants. We've got these sons of God marrying these women, producing these, this this kind of a, for lack of a better term, a hybrid race of part humans, part sons of God, part Elohim, men of renown, immortal, you know, all this kind of crazy stuff. I think for most of us, we've always lived our lives reading the Bible and we think this is all about, it's okay, it's no big deal because after all, we know what's about to happen, right? We know what chapter six is all about. I mean, it's about to be Armageddon for everybody except for Noah and his wife and his three sons and their wives, right? Because God's about ready to just unleash all the water and about ready to just, everybody's going to die. Are they? Are they? You see, hold on. Can we go to verse 7? Can we go to verse 7? And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, the creeping thing, the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. Now I ask you a question. Did, did God make good on this? Yes or no? Yes. Sure he did. Sure he did. And if you believe in a worldwide flood, yeah, everybody, every, every, every man except for Noah and his wife, and his three sons and their wives. And by the way, that is, that is backed up in the New Testament where it says eight, eight souls, two of each animal, except for the clean one. You know, there's some exceptions to some of the clean ones and what have you. But is there something missing? Judy? I don't know if this is the right time, but what happens to the sons of God? They're, they're not human at all. It's so a good question, Judy. There is no mention there of the sons of God, is there? No. There's no mention there of giants. No. See, it, it, it's a little tricky here. The previous verse actually said where God said, it repents me that I made man on the earth. See, and, and here's the thing. See, if we remember... The Elohim, the Elohim were not restricted to the earth. They're celestial beings. They were able to come and go. Well, I, I mean, we're not told. It doesn't say they left. They're also not made of flesh. Mm. They can come back and recreate. Well, and, and by the same token, we also know that, we also believe that some of them were consigned, possibly consigned to the underworld as a punishment. See, there's a lot of things. Things are not always as simple. Now, we can conjecture a lot of things. What the scripture tells us 
is that God said he would destroy man. He would destroy man. What else does the scripture tell us? Well, we know that it's not going to be very long before both of these stories resurface in the scriptures. You see, the rest of the Bible is actually one long holy war. I told you at the beginning of this lesson tonight, this is a turning point. This is actually a turning point in this big story of the Bible. Because the biggest event is actually yet to come. The, I always felt like the flood of Noah's day was the, like, the granddaddy event of Genesis. But actually the Tower of Babel is. We're going to get to that. But let's just can, we just, can we just kind of talk for just a minute? You see, the giants actually get a mention here. Just a mention. Just a brief mention. They actually get much more of a mention when we get to Joshua. The, do you remember the story of the 12 spies going into the promised land? Do you remember that story? Do you remember how the 12 spies go into the promised land? They come back. Do you remember what they said? They were so dismayed and we give them such a hard time. Caleb and Joshua come back and they said, Dude, it's awesome. They said, everything's huge there. It's like Texas. <laughs> they said, everything's huge there. Everything's big there. What were they talking about? They were talking about giants. Now, I think we all, we all sort of made that out like it was symbolic. But was it? Or were they real giants? Well, they made it out like they were real giants. But I think we all sort of, when we read, we sort of passed it off like, wow. oh, they were just scared. Well, what if they were real giants? Well, I always thought they were real giants, but I never knew. Never. Well, where'd they come from, Beverly? That's what I didn't know. I never... Where did those giants come from if they were real giants? Because all the giants should have drowned. Yeah. Well, what about Goliath? What about Goliath? That's right. And his brothers. What about Og and Bashan? See, do you realize there's actually giants talked about all through the Old Testament? Well, okay, so the, where did those giants come from, Sherry? So the giants are going to return. The Israelites are going to fight many times. There's going to be constant battles with the Israelites fighting Philistines and Amorites. And, and there's going to be constant references. Watch, don't miss this. There's going to be constant reference. If you go back and reread your Bible in the next two weeks, <laughs> if you could somehow reread your Old Testament in the next two weeks, sure. there's going to be constant references to gods. Constant references to gods. They're gods. They're gods. They're gods. They're gods. You're going to find that every time, for instance, every time Joshua is fighting a battle with humans there's going to be references to gods. There's going to be another battle being fought. But it's not going to be a human battle. You know, there's, and then there's that thing that Joshua said. Remember that thing that Joshua said? We talked about it last week. I'm going to keep talking about it. Because again, we, we, we keep forgetting what Joshua said in Joshua chapter 24 and verse 15. When, when, it was, when he was trying to get them to to actually make a decision. We always, we like to put it on cross stitches. <laughs> we like to put it on plaques. We like to put it on paintings. But we don't think about what he was actually saying when he said, if it seems evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood. Wait, you mean those were real gods? Real Elohim? Or the gods of the Amorites? Wait, that's not... Okay, wait, time out, time out. The gods that were on the other side of the floods or the gods of the Amorites, that's today he's talking about. He's talking about gods today, today's Amorites. In whose land ye dwell? He's talking about 
those same gods from back there or the gods of today, but as for me and my house, we will serve. Do you see the battle? It's, the battle is ongoing. If you reread the Old Testament, you're going to find out that the battle is, it's an ongoing battle. 